paycheck from work. Can you tell me where all the money goes? In this lesson, I'm going to teach you how to tell your money what to do instead of wondering where it went. Do you know where your money goes every month? I'll bet you don't. But I'm going to show you how to get complete control over your money. Whether you're saving for a car, you're buying a prom dress or a video game, this lesson will explain how to do it. Please welcome nationally syndicated radio host and New York Times best-selling author, Dave Ramsey. We're going to talk about the dreaded B word, the budget. Ooh. Yeah, we're going to have a good time with it, though. See, the fun thing about money is, is if you will happen to your money, then you have some. If you just let all your money happen to you, you'll never win. See, all a budget is, is what Zig Ziglar says. Zig Ziglar says, if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. And most people, with their money, you know what they're aiming at? Nothing. They didn't aim at anything. They just went, right? That doesn't work. A budget is something that, where you take the money that you make, and you make like a list, whether it's like written down or in your head or whatever, um, of how much you can afford to spend on your like necessities and your wants, and such as food, gas, clothes, etc. Specific set how much you spend your money on and how much goes to what. A uh, budget is something that limits on how much you can spend or do on anything. A budget is where you keep money in uh, for savings or for anything else you want to spend money on. Just a place to hold money. John Maxwell, his definition of a budget is excellent. I wish I had said it, but sadly he said it. He said that a budget is people telling their money what to do instead of wondering where it went. So here's the deal. You've got to tell your money what to do. You've got to make it behave. Otherwise, you'll wake up in April, you'll wake up 20 years from now, you'll wake up six decades from now, and you go, wow, I could have had a V8. I've been through all this money, and I wonder where it went. Because you see, money has this principle to it. Money is active. It is moving all the time. It has a current to it. That's why they call it currency. It's going everywhere. Right? And so if you don't get on top of that money, if you don't make it behave, you will always wonder where it went. You will either tell your money what to do, or the lack of it will always manage you. Stephen Covey says in the book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, that highly effective people are proactive. They happen to things. Everything doesn't happen to them. And, and you know, Rick Warren would say that we're intentional. You have to be intentional about what you're doing with money in order to be able to win with it. You must do the written cash flow plan every single month. See, think about it. The average person in America today makes about $40,000 a year, according to the Census Bureau. Ten years of $40,000 a year is $400,000. If you're going to have $400,000 run through your fingers, you need a plan. If you were going to build a $400,000 home, you wouldn't dream of doing that by just saying, you know, I think we'll just put it over there. Instead, you would have a plan. And we call that plan what? We call it a blue a blueprint, right? And, and you, you know, blueprints don't have one page. It's not a little juvenile picture of, of the thing. It's got page after page after page after page. It's got the elevation on here. It's got the bushes on here. It's got where every plug goes. It's got where every drain is in the house. Every piece of plumbing. What type of trimware is going to be in there. What, what type of carpet or hardwood is going to be in each room. Every little detail is laid out in this big, thick book called your house before you ever put a bulldozer on the lot. Before you ever start, everything is planned when you're doing a $400,000 project. And yet we let $400,000 run through our hands in a given 5 or 10 year period of time. And we go, whoa, where'd it go? I have no idea where it went. I feel so inept. Why are you so inept? This isn't rocket science. You've just got to do it. You've got to have a blueprint. You've got to have a game plan. You would never build a $400,000 house by doing that. You see, what we're talking about is if you ran a company called You Incorporated and you manage money for You Incorporated the way you manage money for you now, would you fire you? Don't answer that. <laughs> That's a little scary, isn't it? You know, well, Dave, Dave, I don't know, man. This is intimidating. Yes, it's intimidating. So is being broke. 
So much being out of control and not knowing where I'm going. That's intimidating too. So when you happen to this stuff, you're not going to do it perfectly. You know, your, your budget is not going to work. Say, it's not going to work. The first time you sit down with your spouse and that nerd and that free spirit get together and we have a budget committee meeting and we lay it all out, you know, the first month you're going to have 17 emergency budget committee meetings to do corrections. The next month you're going to have 12 emergency budget committee meetings to do corrections. The next month you're going to have, you're going to have about three or four. It takes three months, three months of doing this to get it right. If you do it right over and over and over again, finally after doing it for about 90 days, you start to get what's known as a clue. Say 90 days. 90 days. It's going to take you 90 days. Your first month's going to be a disaster. And your first budget committee meeting is probably going to be a big fight unless you're very, very careful with your relationship. Because it's going to bring out a bunch of stuff that you've not dealt with in a long, long time. And you're going to have to look that demon straight in the face. And I'm not talking about your spouse. <laughs> and you're going to have to deal with what's going on there. In a very, very real way. Because, you know, it, it's, this is a process where it's a little bit of trial and error. You're going to get in there and figure out what your deal is and how you guys want to do it because your value system is going to be reflected here. You are going to put your personal stamp on this. But it's like Mama used to say, right? Practice makes perfect. And that's the deal with the budget. First month's going to be a little rough. Second month will be a little better. Third month, it'll actually start to work a little bit. But by the time you've been doing it 15 or 20 or 30 years, like Sharon and I have, where after we went broke, we have never lived without a written plan again because we discovered that was the only way we weren't going to kill each other. We had to have a plan because we were, we were, we were a dog. I mean, we were fighting. But I mean, you can have some money fights. We didn't get a divorce, you know. We held on to each other, but sometimes it was just to get a better grip. You know, she's from the hills of East Tennessee. Frying pan throwing there is an Olympic event. <laughs> you know, so, so we had to use this plan to be able to talk things out, to be on a, a game plan. And then when we would lock it in, we'd go, okay, that's what we're doing with money. And, and then we would, we, she was, it was okay for her to go spend that and not feel guilty. It was okay for me to go over here. I wasn't going to get yelled at for doing this. And, and, and all of a sudden, we had a game plan where this worked. But it was trial and error. You don't, you're not immediate, okay, I've been to a class and now I'm an expert. It doesn't work that way, does it? It's kind of like the first time we went snow skiing. Any of you snow ski? Now, a few of you. you know, first time we went snow skiing, I'd never been snow skiing. We went a long, long time ago. First time we made some money before we went broke, right? And I called up the travel agent and I said, hey, I've never been snow skiing. I want to go snow skiing. And I hear cold, cool people go snow skiing. So what do the cool people do when they go snow skiing? Where do they go? And she said, well, they might go to Aspen or Vail. And I said, well, let's just go to Aspen. That sounds cool. So book me. Well, what do cool people do when they go to Aspen? She said, well, you book a condo right on the slope. You don't have to walk anywhere. You just ski in, ski out of the condo. That's what, okay, book me a cool people condo then. So I'm, I'm cool people. I have no idea what I'm doing. No clue. We get over there. We're checking in our skis at the place. And the guy said, so where are you staying? And we told him. And he said, well, you just told me you're a beginner. And we said, yeah. And he started laughing. He said, you're not skiing in and out of that condo. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, you're at the bottom of a double black diamond mountain. He said, you might roll in there, but you're not skiing in there. And so we're sitting there at the bottom of this perfect ski mountain and have no idea how to use it. And so we have to go get on the bus, which I don't think the cool people do. Go down the road a few miles to Buttermilk Mountain. True story. I don't think that's, it just didn't sound as cool as Aspen, you know. Buttermilk Mountain. It was a real mountain, though, I can tell you this. I mean, we were on the bunny slope, and that's a big bunny. <laughs> and you trial and error, right? And you know about the bunny slope. You know how that works. When you're learning to ski, bunny slope has nothing to do with learning to ski. It's learning to ride a chairlift. <laughs> you know, you get a tall, blah, 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 blah. So we, we get out there, we successfully get in the thing, you know, you move over there and the chairlift hits you. You know, we're riding up through there. We're going, okay, we both got on here. We have all of our equipment, which is not like those other people because you see equipment dotted all the way down. You know what I'm talking about. And, and we're coming up on the top. I'm going, okay, we're good. I'm kind of relaxing a little bit. And I look up at the top and there, oh, there's a problem developing at the top of the hill because as the people were getting off the lift, they were just kind of piling up. I said, okay, honey, we got to have a plan. You go around to the right. Since you're on the right, I'll cut in to the left. We're going to miss the pile. We're not going to get in this. And tips up because you don't want to hit and just go boom, you know, right? And so tips up, tips up, okay. I go around left. I cut hard left, and I stop. She goes around right. She hadn't stopped yet. <laughs> she forgot about the stopping part. She just pointed them. And I can't help her. 
I'm just telling the instructor, my wife left. <laughs> he said, well, she'll stop before she hits the restaurant. <laughs> Most of them do, because she's like heading right at it. You know, it looks like a movie, you know? Well, that's how we started. And we've been skiing for years now. We take our kids as big family vacations. Now we can ski the double black diamonds and all that stuff. But that was a couple decades ago. We didn't start out on double black diamond, did we? Same thing with your budget. You can start out there. You're going to have a little trial and error. And just give yourself a little grace to fall down a couple of times and learn the process. Also keep your checkbook balanced, your checking account balanced. And, and I'm amazed at people that don't know how to do this. And I guess it, I, I don't want to shame you and I don't want you to feel guilty for not knowing how to do it, but I want to push you hard enough. If you're not keeping your checkbook reconciled, your checking account reconciled with what's actually happening at the bank, within 72 hours of you receiving the statement, you've got a system broken in your money. People just pile these things up. They go, well, I do it about once a year. And they can't figure out why they have no clue about their money. Balancing your checking account every single month is absolutely vital. Bounce checks are a sign of crisis living, lazy money habits. There's no excuse for that. Well, I know that you should write down whenever you write a check or get money out of the ATM, but what else do you need to do? Well, for starters, you must open and read the bank statement. You know, it's kind of, it sounds kind of basic. Like, get these things in the mail and they just pile up sometimes then you actually use it to reconcile your statement to your checkbook. Are you talking about these things? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. See, we gotta get them opened up, look at them, you know, see what's going on with it. So let's check this one, for example. The first thing you do, you get it out, you read over the statement, and you double check on the statement itself to make sure that you've written down everything that's on the statement is written down in here. Because if something happened here that didn't happen here, then you've got to make sure it's all done there, right? Then you put a little check in here next to each and every transaction. You go every single transaction off the statement, you check it on here. So statement equals a check all the way through here. And you want to record any fees, and they'll go in the debit column like you've written a check. Same column you put a check into if you have a fee. Well, what about a check I wrote? It's not showing up there. Okay, that would be an outstanding check. You've written it in here, but it's not cleared the bank yet. The same thing could happen with a deposit. You could have made a deposit, but it's not showing in the bank yet. So you've got to make adjustments for those for it to work out. So when those, when those checks do clear, well, the, if the money's not in the account, you're going to be bouncing checks. So then how can I balance my checkbook if my balance is different than the balance in the statement because of these uncashed checks? Great question. See, what you do is you take those outstanding checks and you take the outstanding deposits, you look at the ending balance on your statement, and you adjust for the differences. That should then equal this number in your checkbook register. If you do this every single month, you'll never have a bounce check. Now, if you want to learn how to do stuff online, we've always got online tutorials. You go to our website, learn about balancing checkbook, learn about a lot of other things for that matter. And once you get good at doing this manually, then you can also do your web-based system where you can just download from your bank. It's a lot quicker and easier than doing it by hand, but I want you to learn how to do it by hand first. SF stands for Social Farmers. Um, stands for insufficient funds or not sufficient funds. Um, nice and safe for sure. NSF stands for National Security Federation. It's okay. Just call the bank and get it straightened out. Don't let it happen again. Okay. Bye. That was one of my friends freaking out. On our way to the movies last night, she stopped by the ATM and took out 20 bucks. 
Today, when she was using her debit card to pay for her cell phone bill, it was declined. She called the bank and they told her that her account was overdrawn and she owed $55 in fees. That's an NSF, non-sufficient funds. How did this happen? Bad habits and laziness. She wasn't keeping track of her ATM visits. Last night, her balance showed $50, but she really didn't have that much in there. The check she wrote a few days ago just cleared, and when it did, it caused her account to take a nosedive into the negative. Now she has to pay double what she took out. Bottom line, never go by the ATM balance. Always follow what your checkbook says. If you balance your checkbook every month, you won't have this problem. Duh, the ATM machine doesn't know you have any outstanding checks. Really, overdrafts are a sign of crisis living, aren't they? And sloppy, lazy money habits. Because this is, this is sixth grade math, keeping a checkbook. It's just a matter of doing the stuff. I mean, you know, the average millionaire can't tell you what's happening on the average TV show, but their checking accounts balance. And, and so, but don't tell me you know everything about the latest television craze, and you don't have a clue about your own life. Throw a brick through your television, all right? And, and go get you a clue. Spend a few hours a month actually working on your life so you get to win. That's an idea. And you know, automatic overdraft loans now, here's the deal, this year, according to the Center for Responsibility Lending, $10.3 billion in fees charged to Americans this year on overdraft situations. Absolutely out of control stuff. It's a huge profit center for the banking industry. They are feeding off of the American public's incompetence. It's absolutely crazy. And you can use the duplicating or duplicate type checks if necessary. If you're writing checks and you don't, and you forget to write them down, at least you get home and you got that little, you know, NCR copy back there that you can look at and, and you can keep up with them that way. A lot of people aren't using checks nearly as much as they used to. But if that's a problem for you, you use the duplicate situation. If not managed and made to behave, the ATM card and the debit card are also certain to become budget busters. I've met many people who didn't have a big credit card problem, but they were $20 in themselves to death with the ATM, and there was no management of it. It was completely out of control. Now, I don't make you cut up your ATM card, and I'm not, certainly not against the debit card. I have two of those in my wallet right now, one for my business and one for my personal account. And we'll talk about that in the debt lesson quite a bit, but the deal is simply this. You have to make your money behave, whether it's checks, whether it's debit cards, whether it's ATM, whatever's going on, you have to be proactive in these situations. Now, reasons we don't want to do a cash flow plan, most people hate the word budget because it has a straight jacket connotation. If we had told you tonight we're going to teach the budget lesson, nobody would have come. It's like going to get a root canal. I don't want to do a budget. A budget feels like I'm, I'm constricted. I can't do anything. I won't be able to order a pizza. I won't be able to, to buy what I want to buy. It doesn't mean any of that. It just means you have a plan. Second reason people don't want to do a budget is a budget has been used to abuse them. Their parents or maybe their control freak nerd spouse has been twisting their arm at the budget. It's not the budget. It's not the budget. It's not the budget. It's not the budget. Well, listen, if you're in here and you're an adult, well, you have a vote. And if it's not in the budget, you can put it in the budget. Because you're part of the voting process in the budget committee meeting. So put it together and put it in the budget. And then if, if together we decided it's not in the budget, that means we've learned a new word. No. It's an ancient word. It's actually been pulled from political correctness completely out of our society. You're not allowed to tell anyone no for any reason ever, including your kids. No is a word that is no longer allowed to use in our culture. It's gotten completely, isn't it funny? Let's practice it. You push your tongue, because nobody uses it, we have to practice it. Push your tongue towards the roof of your mouth, you release air, make a kissing motion with your lips. No. Ooh, it's freeing, isn't it? Sometimes you have to tell yourself, no. So later you can tell yourself, yes. Hey, hey. That's living like no one else, so later I can, that's how that works. It's sacrificing to win. That's not abuse. Now, another reason we don't like to do a budget is we never had one that really worked. We tried the old yellow pad budget, you know? We're going to add it all up. We're only going to eat every other week. You remember that. I remember when we were broke, Sharon, when I would go to work, she would make my sandwiches. 
And I still a lot of times take take food to work because I, I don't like to try to eat. I don't want food. I'm a time nut. I want to I want to get better use of time. Plus, I eat with my team and that kind of a thing. And, and so it's not uh, it's not unusual at all for me to pack my lunch. But I'll tell you what, I don't eat. I don't eat tuna fish because when we were broke, she always packed me a tuna fish sandwich. So when I smell tuna fish, I feel broke. I know it's frou fru and it's cool and it's good for weight loss. It just it touches my emotions way down deep. So I don't I can't eat tuna fish. It just it takes me back places I don't want to go. Another reason we don't want to do a budget is paralysis from fear of what we'll find. That's called denial. You look at the bill drawer and you go, ooh, there's gremlins in there. If I open that, they'll get out. I'm afraid to stick my hand down in there, something will gnaw it off. I'm afraid if I write everything down, I'll freak out because it's really bad. Well, guess what? That means it's probably really bad. And you're going to really freak out when they take your house. So you need to write it down. Okay? Yes, there's going to be some things you're not going to want to face when you see it. But I tell you what, it's easier to face them and cleanse the wound and let it heal than it is just let it continue, continue to be infected. And, and so face that fear. Do it. A lot of times when people add up their budget and stuff and add up their bills, particularly if you're behind on your bills, it's not nearly as bad as you thought it was when you write it all down. You go, oh, it was just a stack of old bills. There's really only one deer. We'll throw all the late ones away and this is the one. Because it's got all of it on there anyway, right? I mean, it's not like those others mattered. We weren't going to pay back there. This is just the one we got to deal with. So, and you know, and so sometimes a big box of stuff turns into a little stack of stuff like this. If you get organized and lay it all out, that is the best way to do it. You know, one guy, he was doing his budget and laid everything out. He's kind of a good old boy guy, you know, and he says, you know, Dave, he said, we added it all up. So we looked at our past few months. We've been eating out too much. I said, what do you mean you've been eating out too much? He said, we've been eating out too much. So what do you mean? He said, well, we added all up. We've been spending about $1,200 a month on restaurants. I went, whoa, just what you're saying. He said, yeah, I figured out how, why I didn't have a retirement. I've been eating it. <laughs> so, so sometimes it's good things that you find. You can now make positive choices and go, hey, that isn't really who I want to be when I grow up. <laughs>